you can imagine our delight when we were working with Gary to arrange this, um, this talk, that we've discovered that there are Tasmanian connections to the story of Age Forward. I can't wait to hear all about what they are. So would you join me in welcoming Dr. Wesky? <laughs> Ah, good afternoon. This is a really nice, intimate setting, isn't it? So uh, hopefully there will be a little bit of time if your patience hasn't been worn out uh, for a bit of Q&A uh, at the end, but there, there is a lot uh, to, to get through. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge First Nations peoples, not just uh, in Tasmania, but throughout Australasia, because apart from anything else, it is their country that is the great subject of Australian settler art. And indeed, this is very much in evidence in the work of A.H. Fullwood and his contemporaries. Now, Fullwood has probably been forgotten most everywhere. So if you haven't heard of him or heard of him very much, you're an incredibly good company. Uh, and that includes the Art Society of Tasmania, apparently, because their website states the following. The Art Society of Tasmania had an impressive early membership, including artists J. Houghton Forrest, William C. Pigeny, Arthur Streeton, G.B.F. Mann, and Lady Teresa Hamilton, wife of Governor Sir Robert Hamilton, who held sketching classes. The Art Society's annual exhibition attracted many artists of note from the mainland, including Julian Ashton, Tom Roberts, Frederick McCubbin, and Blamire Young. All right, no awards for noting who was missed in this list. And the classic irony, and this applies to so many aspects of Fullwood's life, is if it had not been for Fullwood, almost none of those artists would have come to the attention of the Art Society of Tasmania or even exhibited here, as you'll uh, soon discover uh, in this talk. Nonetheless, Fullwood did have a, an incredibly interesting impact on artistic life here during the 1890s. So the question you might be asking yourself is so how and why did a biography ever come to be published of a dead white male artist, best known as an illustrator of a forgotten book written by a completely unknown writer? And the answer, of course, to that question is it wasn't easy. <laughs> and, 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 and yet, this, this has a history, so I think we have to give you, if you like, some explanation or justification. So the project actually began in 1985, although I didn't know it at the time. But in that year, I saw this painting, the Shawhaven from Camberwara by Fullwood, done in 1892, and they also exhibited in Chicago at the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893. Uh, it was hanging on the wall of a woman that I was about to start courting quite seriously, who is sitting here in the room today. That's Hillary with the red mask over there. And the reason it was hanging on her wall is because Fullwood had given this painting just before his death, gave, had given it to Hillary's mother, who was Fullwood's niece. So there is, in fact, a family history connection here. 25 years and four grandchildren later, Hillary suggested, probably to her regret now, that I write a jokey uh, little picture book for our grandchildren about their famous uh, relation, or not so famous relation, but at any rate, interesting relation, uh, Uncle Remus, as he was called by his mates because he was such a good storyteller around Café Noirs and the Café Francais or around uh, campfires in Sirius Cove. Anyway, this was a present that the kind of present that as grandparents we are obliged to give, which is the gift that none of our grandchildren want. And in fact, sure enough, we succeeded. They weren't that interested. But, but it did begin to interest me as an historian. Maybe there was more to this fellow's life and art than we might have been led to, to, to believe. So I began researching in earnest for about four years and I discovered quite quickly that Fullwood was, apart from anything else, an incredibly prolific illustrator, both in something called the Picturesque Atlas and then later in the illustrated newspapers of Sydney and, and, Lon and London. And then, in 2013, 
um, I ran across a curator from the Art Gallery of New South Wales, Natalie Wilson, extraordinary curator. Ran across her by chance, and she asked what I was doing, and I explained, and she said, why, Fullwood is one of my favorite artists. Well, can I tell you, I had not heard this exclamation, particularly from anybody in the art world, uh, before that time. And, and uh, Natalie was particularly interested in Fullwood's work on the picturesque atlas. And so what she proposed over the next year or so is why wouldn't she and I collaborate to try to get up an exhibition about the artists of the picturesque atlas, of whom Fullwood was one of the most important. And then on the strength of that, maybe that would build a case for me to take to a publisher to say it would be worthwhile to develop a biography. Well, we did succeed as far as the exhibition is concerned because last year at the National Library of Australia, Natalie and I were able to, put, to mount a nation imagined the artists of the picturesque atlas. It began in March, it ended in July. Sadly, no budget for a catalog, which is tragic given the amount of research that went into it. But over 20,000 visitors went through the exhibition, which in a time of COVID was a triumph. And it was you know, widely uh, hailed as an incredibly interesting and eye-opening sort of exhibition. In the meantime, on the promise of that, Elspeth Menzies at New South Books saw the proposal and she said, we all want to hear more about Fullwood. So the result was this really handsome volume that New South has brought out, 76 color plates, 50 black and white illustrations done on real paper. It weighs a kilogram. It's a real book. <laughs> it's a real book. Beautifully, beautifully produced uh, indeed. And in it, of course, is the story of, of Fullwood's life and times, as well as his art. We can't go into his life and times today. That, that's uh, too, too big a story. But just to say that it is as full of pathos and plot turns, to, plot turns as a three-volume Victorian novel. Um, but again, we're here today to talk about uh, the art. And what I've been attempting to do in this long journey now with Fullwood is obviously to get people interested in Fullwood's extraordinary uh, ca career and his art, but also to use his experience, his history, to re-see Australian history and the stories we tell about the Australian art of that time, because things look very different of that, in that era once you begin to look at it from the standpoint of Fullwood as a Sydney artist illustrator. In addition today, though, I'll also be highlighting Fullwood's significant engagement with Tasmania's landscape and his influence and impact on the Tasmanian art world of the 1890s. So let's begin at the beginning. Fullwood was born in 1863 in Birmingham. This is a bird's eye view of Birmingham from the graphic of 1886. Fulwood was born into a family of jewelers. You may know that Birmingham was the empire's leading center of jewelry manufacture, uh, and Melbourne was its second best market after London. Um, everything was going swimmingly as far as the great jewelers of Birmingham were concerned, except that they were facing significant contribution from the French, who were seen to have of superiority in design due to the superiority of the art education and influences surrounding them in Paris. So consequently, there was a huge push in the 1860s and 1870s to lay on detailed art education classes for the apprentices, the jewelers, the jewelers apprentices, also developed the, the Birmingham Gallery. And it succeeded in many ways uh, in, in sponsoring the interests of jewelers and their apprentices um, in art almost too well, including this fellow, John Fullwood, who is A.H. Fullwood's second cousin, it's about seven years older. He was an electroplater at the age of 16, but by age 21, he had turned his back on jewelry making for full-time painting. And he was one of the Birmingham boys who, among other things, set up something called the Newland School of Painting uh, in the 1870s and 1880s. And he certainly served as a role model in clothing, if nothing else for the young Albert Henry Fullwood, although young Albert Henry does one better with that fabulous hat uh, over the top. In 1881, at the age of 18, 
Uh, Albert Henry uh, exhibited for the first time at the Royal Birmingham Society of Artists alongside his older cousin, John Fulwood. And there's every reason to believe that had Albert Henry stayed in Birmingham, um, he could have gone on to have uh, emulated the relatively successful career of John Fulwood, if not uh, to, to have done him one better. However, in 1883, uh, Albert Henry's father, John Frederick Fulwood, died at the age of 50 of cirrhosis of the liver, which was an interesting disease for him to have contracted in a strongly temperance household in, Bir in, in Birmingham. And it was obviously a significantly traumatic event that within six months, Fulwood found himself leaving Plymouth Harbor on a ship bound for Sydney with his mother and his two youngest sisters. And here he arrived in Sydney. This is uh, uh, by Fulwood. This is a bird's eye view of Sydney, which uh, Fulwood did for the Sydney Mail in the centenary year, 1888. It's the largest wood engraved illustration ever done in Australia, 60 by 90. Uh, this is a hand colored version of it. It's actually quite a spectacular take on Sydney. Uh, I, I still think it's one of the best views I've ever seen. And you'll notice the family resemblance to that view I showed you of Birmingham. So here we have the significant civic buildings in the foreground, but unlike the hellish industrial landscape that we saw in Birmingham, of course, Sydney had this rather magnificent harbor. Uh, Fulwood, of course, must have been wondering in this time, what in the world had he walked into? Well, what he'd walked into, in fact, was one of the most important colonial outposts of the British art world. And he found many English-born and trained artists already working in Sydney. And the primary means of support was working in the illustrated press. And Bernard Smith, one of the doyens of British art history, said long ago that, in fact, Australia, and more particularly Sydney, was one of the world's leading centers of black and white art. And it's really interesting to take that in because, of course, we don't talk very much now about the black and white art of that era in the same breath as we do of Australian Impressionism, which was, for all its merits was not necessarily in the avant-garde as far as the practice of art was concerned, but our, the black and white illustrations were. There's Ashton's drawing of uh, Ned Kelly on the left and Phil May's delightful uh, picture of Sir Henry Parks being annoyed by a political opponent in the shape of a pesky mosquito. I think that image could be used today for politicians unnamed. <laughs> At any rate, at any rate, Fulwood's great chance came only two years after he arrived in Sydney, when at the age of 22, he would become a staff artist for something called the Picturesque Atlas of Australasia. Now, the Picturesque Atlas was not a British invention. It, in fact, came from a coalition of American entrepreneurs, capitalists, engravers, illustrators, cartographers, and printers who came en masse to Sydney in 1885 following their great success with a publication called Picturesque Canada. And the feeling was that Australia was ripe for such a publication uh, itself. The great selling point of the Atlas would in fact be its original art made on the spot and translated into really beautiful wood engraved uh, illustrations. The Atlas hired soon significant local artists, including Julian Ashton, Frank Marnie, W.C. Pigeny, and of course, Fulwood, all working under the direction of Frederick Schell, who was one of the great illustrators for Harper's Weekly in the second half of the, the 19th century. So can you imagine a 22-year-old having this opportunity drop in his, into his lap, a chance to go all around Australia, discovering its various beauties, rich and rare, from Darwin and uh, Thursday Island all the way down through the countrysides of New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, and South Australia. Um, able to do this and at the same time learn more of the trade from one of the world's great artist illustrators, uh, Frederick Schell. The Atlas was produced in 42 parts between 1886 and 1889. It was sold on the Never Never to 50,000 subscribers for a grand total of 10 guineas, which is the equivalent of $1,200 in current prices. 
So just imagine that. People laid out that money for a three-volume unpublished artwork. What do you reckon the chances of such a venture would be today in Australia? Hard to say. At any rate, as a result of it being produced in parts, each part was viewed and reviewed all across Australia in 1,600 articles between, in three years and 700 advertisements. It was the most viewed and reviewed art project in the history of Australia. And yet again, not something that really people very, very much know. And one of the characteristic refrains in the, rev in the reviews was that the atlas represented the birth of art beneath the Southern Cross. That's how it was received. A real breakthrough moment for artists and artist illustrators uh, in Australia. And most significantly, it was the only lavish picturesque uh, travel book produced in the 19th century that was an atlas. Um, I've tried to give you an idea of the size by tilting the map of Tasmania because, uh, on its side because it was produced across two pages. So you can get a rough idea of just how magnificent uh, the maps were, how detailed they were. Um, we'll put you on the map was one of the sales points uh, for the, uh, the Atlas's sales, sales people. At any rate, Fullwood produced in the end something like 20% of the signed pictures in the, uh, in the Atlas. There are over 800 of these in the Atlas. I'll give you just three of them. This is a uh, view of Lake Karangamite from Mount Lura. Um, and you'll notice that the sheep are as interested in the view as we are. <laughs> and looking out on this incredible vista, you'll even see a train in the valley below, probably taking bales of wool uh, of their brethren down to, uh, down to Melbourne. But this mastery of great distances, Fullwood already had when he was a 23, 24 year old, uh, because it really is an extraordinary uh, capturing of that viewpoint. On the other hand, he could produce more intimate work. In this case, this is a view of Dubbo. I wouldn't expect you to recognize Dubbo just straight off from this. But what you might notice is this is a great example of what uh, illust illustrators could do, the playfulness of illustration as opposed to two-dimensional art, because here we have that tree breaking through the nominal picture frame to provide a canopy for the, the scene in, in that way. It's a rather Japanese kind of effect uh, and rather lovely at that. But also, the Atlas was there to celebrate the colonial modernity, the prosperity, the achievements of settler colonial Australia, particularly as demonstrated in some of its more prosperous regional towns. You may recognize this as Sturt Street, Ballarat. And one of the things that Full would love to do was dress up Australians even more than they might normally be dressed up. So they are dressed to the nines. I don't know what day it was at that point, but they were looking good that day. Uh, when Fullwood uh, did his sketch. This is now a signature work in the, Ball in the Ballarat Art Gallery. This is actually the original drawing, in fact. Uh, um, however, Fullwood did not come to Tasmania for the picturesque atlas. The atlas instead sent none other than Fred Schell, as well as W.C. Pickney here, to make the original sketches uh, of Australia, of Tasmania's magnificent landscape uh, and its major cities. But I thought I'd show you just a few anyway. This is Cape Raoul, is done by Fred, Fred Schell in the best Gothic tradition of Har Harper's Weekly. So, I mean, everything's heaving, right? The seas and the ship is pitching up against those uh, magnif magnificent cliffs. And of course, Pigany was sent to, as he did so well, portray in his own inimitable style some of the great landmarks of the Tasmanian landscape. This is Frenchman's Cap. I wish we had time because we could dwell on so many aspects of this art, but you'll notice just the richness of the engraving here. I mean, just how beautiful and subtle the tonality is in what both Pigany and the engravers were able to do. But also was featured a number of townscapes and other curious aspects of Tasmania, including this view of uh, Launceston from the Cataract Gorge. And here's an interesting thing about the views at the, at the time of the Atlas. People in the local papers, they loved the views of other people's cities. But when it came to their city, it was never good enough. And this was the view of the Launceston Daily Telegraph, which didn't like the view of its cities, which, quote, can only be discerned 
faintly in the distance. The drawing of the cataract bridge is also faulty, while one of the most prominent structures is the public baths, which no Launcestonian wants to see, unquote. <laughs> anyway, despite all of that, uh, they seem to get, get along fine in Launceston with, otherwise with the, with the atlas. But the Hobart Mercury was equally grumpy about Shell's view uh, of, of Hobart, but they did rather like uh, Fullwood's drawing of McGregor's Gardens looking out to, to the city. This is the original drawing of Fullwood, which is in TMAG. He obviously worked either from photographs or one of Shell's uh, sketches, but at any rate, Fullwood got the credit for the best view of Hobart. Uh, in, the view, in the view of the Mercury. And I've just put on the left the original and on the right the engraving, just to give you some idea of the fidelity with which courtesy of something called photo process engraving, as well as the skill of the engravers, allowed for uh, a really extraordinary reproduction um, of, the, of the original artworks. Well, by the a ripe old age of 24, Fullwood had overnight become one of Australia's best known artists. And on the strength of that, he was able to secure important positions as staff illustrator for the Sydney Mail, as well as the London, London Graphic. And illustration was important to most of the Sydney artists, but especially Fullwood, because he could subsidize their work as painters at the same time as being very well paid to practice uh, their skills as draftsmanship and getting down a scene quickly. And the, the, the boundaries between fine art and illustration you know, were much more indistinct than they are today because illustration, the art of illustration, was seen as a significant art form in its own right. But here's a painting from the Blue Mountains, Prince Regent's Glen which Fullwood did in 1888, showed it at the Art Society of New South Wales in September, and then three months later, took that scene and put it on the cover of the Sydney Mail's Christmas annual uh, supplement, but again able to play around with it as an illustrator would by bringing the wall out from that trompe telescopic view of his own artwork. Uh, at any rate, great fun having, that he had with it. As an illustrator, Therefore, Fullwood was called upon to, if you like, capture Australia as it was at, at, the, at the time. And the result was um, he was called upon, and let me get to the right page here, he was called upon to capture celebrations of empire, uh, the centenary of settlement, and impending federation. So this is a group portrait of the Federation Convention in Sydney. It's one of the most striking I have seen, if you like, coming out of that period. And that commanding figure of Henry Parks is there. And interestingly, it was the London Graphic which called for this, because readers back in, uh, in London were as interested as here in what was happening uh, with the progress of, of Federation. Um, but apart from all of that, as a newspaper illustrator, Fullwood was expected to cover what newspapers covered. And you'll be amazed to know that they were covering disasters, sporting events, holidays, and tourism. And as a result, the iconography of illustration reflected Australia as it was in contrast to the rural mythologies and grand historical landscapes that we associate with Streeton and Roberts and the Australian Impressionists. So if you wanted to get a sense of who were the artists of modern life, to use a cliche well known to art historians, um, you'd have to go to the black and white art of the illustrators rather than the painters whom we now know so much, so much better. And in the black and white art, Fulwood could also turn his hand as a, an occasional cartoonist for the Bulletin, and along with George Lambert and Frank Marnie, created the original Dad and Dave, and as well as the other illustrations for uh, Steel Rudd's On Our Selection in 1899. Um, Hillary likes, uh, likes Dad there, Leave My Roof. I don't know whether that has any family resemblances for us, but I particularly like the, uh, the parson and the parson and the scum. Uh, Fullwood just loved sending up clergymen for some reason, and this was a particularly nice example uh, of that interest. But otherwise, he was continuing to gain in skill and stature and recognition 
as a, as a fine artist, as a painter, as a watercolorist, as well as, a, as somebody working in oils. Here are two examples. One on the left is Wet Evening George Street, a charcoal study for an oil painting made in 1889. And 10 years later, something called Reflections, which is actually picturing his wife, young wife, Clyda, coming down by the GPO in Sydney. And one of the interesting things I think about art in this period is that the sun is always shining in the countryside and on Sydney Harbor, but in the cities, it's always raining. And one reason for that, of course, is that rain splashed pavements are like catnip to artists who are wanting to demonstrate their skill, but drawing upon the highlights that are created in that kind of, kind of uh, environment. It was something you'll see in the work of French Impressionists as well at the same time. Otherwise, Fullwood's work uh, as a fine artist very much uh, echoed the similar range of work that, that Roberts and Streeton uh, were doing at the same time. So Fullwood continued uh, to develop his work as a landscape, landscapist, using that experience that he had through the Atlas to extend his mastery, in this case of a watercolor view of Jervis Bay uh, from, from Camberwara. And a claim that I will make, which um, I've only in partly verified, is that if you contrast Streeton's landscapes that he did in Victoria with those that he did in New South Wales, you'll see a distinct change, particularly of perspective. And the perspective that he came to adopt is the one that Fullwood had been using in his landscapes consistently from his time at the, at the picturesque atlas. Fullwood could also, as with Tom Roberts, also capture scenes of both the hardship and the pleasures of rural, rural, rural life. Uh, this is a, an oil uh, in the National Gallery, uh, simply called B uh, Bad News, and the emotional intensity of the scene in that enclosed uh, environment of the, the hut, contrasted with the high-keyed beating sun outside, provides a, a really quite a strong painting. But in contrast, he could also paint some of the, the, the delights, if you like, of life on the land, particularly delightful if it happened to be on the estate of one of your main patrons, George Matcham Pitt, by the Hawkesbury. This is a picture of Matcham Pitt's family. It's called The Swing. And you can just about make out the swing. But anyway, any rate, there is that young girl in, su in suspended animation uh, over, over that particular scene. But of course, you couldn't be a Sydney artist if you weren't going to be offering uh, depictions of the harbor. Basically, Fullwood, uh, Ashton, and others have been painting in plein air artist camps from the early 1880s on, onwards. Uh, and this is uh, a uh, plein air oil sketch that Fullwood did of Edwards Beach. This is Balmoral Beach with a view out to the, head, out to the heads. And these works were being done four or five years before Streeton and Roberts came to occupy and paint so magnificently uh, the same territory. Um, finally, a yacht-side view of Broken Bay uh, to, the, to, to the north that Fullwood did for another patron who had a cracking great yacht built for him. Fullwood supplied these cedar oil paintings that went inside the cabin uh, of the yacht. And it's, it's really quite a lovely uh, yacht-side view, if you like, of that scene. So, on the strength of that work, both as an illustrator and as an artist, uh, Fullwood achieved considerable recognition in Sydney at that time as one of the most significant artists uh, working between the mid-1880s and the late uh, 18, 1890s. He was also shown internationally. I mentioned in Chicago, the New South Wales government sent uh, a great cache of paintings to the World Columbian Exposition in 1893, Tom Roberts uh, got a gold, uh, gold medal for a portrait. Uh, Ellis Rowan got a gold medal for one of her uh, many flower paintings. The picturesque Atlas got a gold medal as an outstanding publication. But Fullwood took, got four gold medals for works that he had submitted at that, at that time. So I don't necessarily think that means a whole lot other than to say he was more than holding his own with people that we would now acknowledge as, if you like, the outstanding artists uh, of his generation. And therefore, it won't surprise you to know that when Streeton and Roberts came to Sydney in 1890 as economic refugees from Victoria, because they couldn't sell their paintings there, 
That Fullwood was the only Sydney artist that actually lived under canvas with Robertson Streeton in Sirius Cove and began a 30-year close friendship between, the, between these three became particularly important when they all found themselves in London um, after 1900. Fullwood was also significantly involved with Roberts in forming the breakaway, young, uh, breakaway group of younger artists from the Art Society of New South Wales to form the Society of Artists in 1895. And looking back then on the career of this extraordinary, wonderful collection of artists working in Sydney uh, in the 1890s, the artist and critic David Souter reviewed the work in individual articles of Roberts, Streeton, and Fullwood, among others. And this is what he had to say about Fullwood in 1906. Englishman though he be, yet for some strenuous years of his life, A.H. Fullwood was the most Australian of all our Australian artists. Make of that, again, what you will, but again, it's an indication that he was somebody who was being reckoned with as a significant uh, person working in the Sydney and Australian art scene. Okay, now we come to Tasmania. So why Tasmania? If Fullwood was doing so well, why would he bother with, sorry, Tasmania? <laughs> okay, and the, and the short answer, a answer is, in a way, he, he he needed to go somewhere else because the Sydney art market began collapsing around him from the early 1890s onwards, um, both the market for illustration as well as for fine art. And Fullwood decided then to try his hand at setting up a second front for his artistic career in Tasmania. And what Tasmania offered Fullwood was, of course, first of all, new subjects, the harbor and the Hawkesbury and Heidelberg have all done, been done a lot. What about somewhere else? It would create a new market for his work and it would also offer him the chance uh, to give art classes to affluent young women um, here in Tasmania. And what Fullwood offered Tasmania was the engagement of a significant mainland artist in elevating the work of local artists and the standing of its art world. So, in early March 1893, for the first time, Fullwood arrives in Hobart, also goes to Launceston, does sketching trips in the New Norfolk district, but above all is testing the market and the interest here, both for his work as an artist and as an art teacher. He satisfied himself within a month that this was a goer, so he quickly went back to Sydney, organized himself, brought back a number, not only of his Tasmanian sketches, but a couple of his paintings as well, just to show the folks here what was going on uh, in the mainland at that time, and secured commitments from both the Launceston Art Society and the Tasmanian Art Society to offer art classes. And when I say the Art Society of Tasmania, of course, I'm really talking about the woman on the right, Louisa Swan, who was uh, an absolute Dynamo, and I don't think I have to tell, tell you this. I mean, she was absolutely the, 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 the person who kept this art society moving forward in the 1890s, particularly in, uh, in, in Hobart, um, but also uh, Launceston. And uh, on the left, we have Mabel Hookie, who was one of Fullwood's other outstanding students at that time. So you can begin to see how the legacy uh, is, is, is being built up by Fullwood at this time. Um, the Hobart Mercury was clear at the beginning of 1894 that Fullwood had already made an impact on local art when it said, some events of special importance to the cause of art in Tasmania have occurred during the past year. The art societies have held their usual quarterly meetings and the works that have been exhibited show a decided improvement. This was due in a great measure to the fact that the Hobart Society engaged Mr. A. H. Fullwood of Sydney to form classes in Hobart and in connection with the Launceston uh, Art Society. Fullwood also brought with him uh, a painting by Ashton and also one by himself, Declining, uh, Declining Day, Pyrmont Bridge. And again, the Mercury grasped uh, uh, immediately the significance of having works like this shown uh, locally. So again, a quoting, um, the Mercury described this work as powerfully realistic 
and as a study in rigorous treatment of landscape. And it will attract much attention and be a reminder to the art students in Tasmania who have studied under Mr. Fullwood of the strong points in his teaching. The art-loving public of Hobart will assuredly appreciate the spirit which has prompted the artist to adorn the gallery here with this splendid example of his art. Now, Fullwood was not letting the grass grow under him, even in the short time in 1893 that he was working here in, in, in Launceston and Hobart, because he then proceeded to write um, a pretty cheeky letter in May of 1893 to the Mercury about the proposed international exhibition that would take place in Hobart at the end of 1894, beginning of 1895. And this is what Fullwood had to say. Why not make art more of a feature of the international exhibition? Make it an exhibition of industry, science, and art. And this is what he's had to say, declare in the Mercury. He'd only been here six weeks, mind. But he says, it is well known that in all international exhibitions that have been held to date, the art section has been the most interesting, popular, and lasting of their attractions. I would suggest the special efforts be put forward by the directors of your coming exhibition to get together as good an art exhibit as possible from all countries and climes and to ensure a good exhibit to get the cooperation of the best artists as subcommittees in the different countries invited to send. Fullwood then nominated all the artists in New York and London and Melbourne and Sydney, et cetera, that the ex exhibition should, co should uh, contact. And then he modestly said the Piccanine, he could probably do the work for Tasmania. A grumpy letter writer responded, do you know the Piccanine has never even been to Europe? <laughs> Nevertheless, that was, the that was the recommendation that Fullwood was putting forward. And the expectation that Fullwood then goes on to say is that if this is taken uh, forward, in the Tasmanian context, it will be a tremendous l stimulus to local talent for the first international exhibition held in the colony to be opened, giving them the time to prove what can be produced here. So it was like a stretch goal for the local artists, particularly, tes uh, for, particularly for Fullwood students, to see how much they could grow in stature and put on uh, a good demonstration of their work at the international exhibition. And just two weeks later in the Mercury, the general manager of the exhibition, Jules Joubert, heartily endorsed Fullwood's suggestion. And that's all Louisa Swan needed to become, if you like, the dynamic duo of this operation. She immediately then organized herself to go to Melbourne and to Sydney to lobby the art worlds there to participate in the Art Society of Tasmania's exhibition the following year and then the international exhibition uh, the year after that. And uh, she, she wrote to the, uh, to the Mercury um, and said, look, good examples of the Australian School of Painting would be invaluable, not only as additions to the galleries, but also from an educational point of view. Mr. Fullwood has done much by mentioning our show to the Sydney artists and is also prepared to send work himself. I hope we shall be able to secure his assistance at the time of the exhibition as he visits Hobart in January next. Amongst the 12 pictures Mr. Fullwood exhibited at the New South Wales Art Society were several Tasmanian subjects. And this was one of the subjects that Fullwood uh, showed in that particular year. Uh, this is the Hop Pickers, uh, uh, New Norfolk, uh, Tasmania, widely praised and eventually found its way into TMEG's collection, but long after Fullwood had died. Uh, but nevertheless, there it went. So, Fullwood was well and truly entrenching himself in the art world here and gaining new inspiration himself for his own art through his, his Tasmanian subjects. So, Fullwood came back at the end of 18, uh, 1893, stayed for the first three months of 1894, and this began a cycle of regular visits on Fullwood's part. He was the only major mainland artist uh, that continued to maintain this degree of connection to Tasmania, its art world, uh, and its lo local artists. Um, and in the middle of 1894, Fullwood put an ad in the Hobart Mercury, which simply read, wanted a real old man in old clothes as artist model 
apply Mr. Fullwood Museum between 9 and 10 o'clock. Well, what do you reckon? <laughs> There's Louisa Swan doing life classes with Fullwood at exactly that time. This looks to me like a real old man and significantly old clothes. So I'm just going to take a punt and at least say it should be true that, in fact, this particular work, which is on the easel there and has been exhibited recently, is, in fact, uh, the, the artwork that came out of that particular, uh, that particular class. Um, at any rate, Fullwood continued his, his work along these lines in 1897 on an extended visit. After the international exhibition had occurred in which, surprise, surprise, Pigany and he scooped the pools with the honors uh, for their Australian and Tasmanian works. But when Fullwood came back in 1897, the Hobart Mercury devoted the enti entire page one of its April 1, 1897 edition to an interview with Fullwood about the Australian Impressionist School. Now, I have to tell you, there were a lot of snarky comments in the local press about this Impressionist school. People just did not know what to, what to make of it. But Fullwood was seen as kind of just within the pale as far as Impressionism was concerned, and they wanted to interview Fullwood as to what it was about. As it tur turns out, and Ashley, you may have seen this interview, but if you haven't, it's really worth a look because as far as I know, it is the only occasion where one of the significant Australian artists at that time actually sat down and explained in detail what Impressionism meant to them, not what's been imputed to them by later historians. And Fullwood went out of, his, out of his way to say that Impressionism is the most difficult style of painting of all, yet like many other difficult things, it seems to be comparatively easy and among the exponents that he mentioned were Whistler, Manet, Corot, Constable, and Turner. All right, not Monet, not the other French artists that we commonly associate uh, with, with Impressionism, because this is, in fact, what they were working from, that, that con those kinds of uh, aesthetic influences, tonal realism, planarism, and, and all of that. But at the end of the interview, Fulwood also says to the interviewer, Look, you have a few really clever lady artists belonging to your local art society, and the citizens ought to encourage them because to discourage them is to discourage native art. And this is rare praise from a leading male artist of that era for the work that women artists were doing, uh, particularly in fine art and not just in decorative painting uh, and, and craft work. At any rate, from there, Fullwood went on to do more Tasmanian pictures, large pictures of, uh, for example, Ma Hobart and Mount Wellington from Belle Reve, also of an old windmill, etc. But like so many of Fullwood's larger works, these have disappeared from view. But they were, both on the mainland and here in Tasmania, greatly appreciated uh, at the time. Um, the work of Julia Swan and Mabel Hookey was likewise being increasingly recognized in the annual exhibitions of the Art Society uh, and very much praised and, of course, linked with uh, the teachings of Fullwood. So, in 1895, Fullwood uh, showed what we now call uh, the picture Hugh and Bell, a very large watercolor, which is in the, the TMAG co collection. I believe this is a Tasmanian subject, but it was shown at the same exhibition, and I'm going to show it to you anyway, because I think it is a really remarkable painting for that period, really testing the limits of light, just as the faint final embers of light are hitting uh, the cliff, uh, the trees, the house in the, in, in the background, and so forth, against that very cold saffron-colored sky. Uh, it's in a private collection, but it's, it's, it's a substantial work. The next three are little plein air oil sketches that Fullwood did in Newtown between 1897 and 1898 and are contemporaneous with some, of, some others that I'm going to show you by Louisa Swan and Mabel Hookey. Uh, this is that old windmill, right, which is going to come up time and time again, and his work couldn't get away from it. Um, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely work, partly for the, the brushwork, but also because of that slash of yellow-green in the, in the middle ground, separating the cool greens in the foreground and the blues elsewhere. Um, this is a bucolic scene 
of the farmland around Newtown uh, at that time. It was recently auctioned. Hint to any local galleries here, all these things only go for a few thousand. Uh, and it would be great to have more examples uh, of this work uh, in the galleries. Here's one of haymaking uh, around Newtown. It's a poor reproduction, but you get some idea of, of the liveliness uh, and color and treatment that Fullwood gave. But this is a work by Louisa Swan of the o old town, uh, of, the, of the old mill uh, in, in New Newtown. It's taken from a catalog, so I apologize for the reproduction. But you can see a lot of the characteristic Fullwood tropes as well, the very detailed foreground with the native vegetation, the blue hills in the background, and then the centerpiece occupying there the, uh, the center right uh, position. Um, this is a, an old ship uh, in uh, the Derwent, the Derwent Hunter, uh, that Louisa Swan also painted as, a, as an oil sketch in a color scheme and palette very similar to Human Bell, which I showed you earlier. But to be honest, Mabel Hookie, who was about 10 years younger uh, than Louisa Swan, was, if anything, an even more accomplished uh, artist and took with her into her painting style in the late 1890s and later many of the aspects of that full blooming impressionism uh, that Fulwood was also bringing uh, here to Tasmania. This is taken on the Rokeby estate, which she, in fact, eventually inherited. Uh, and uh, I particularly uh, love this work. Um, and here's a harvest scene also from Rokeby that she did about, about 10 years later. How's that? OK. In December of 1899, however, the Art Society of Tasmania uh, noted noted that Mr. Fullwood, who is a member of this society, intends leaving Australia for America next year and will probably visit Hobart again before leaving. The society heartily wishes uh, him well uh, whilst in America. But Fullwood, in fact, didn't return to Tasmania in January of 1900, nor, in fact, did he ever return to Tasmania again. And after a year in New York, he ended up in London along with Street and Roberts and most of the diaspora of expatriate artists uh, at that time. <laughs> this is a, uh, an oil painting of Vauxhall Bridge done in 1909, kind of homage to, to Turner. Um, but it was also shown at the second Venice Biennale as part of the, uh, the British uh, pavilion. Um, and Fullwood, who of course was English born, and Birmingham train, trained. It was a kind of second homecoming, even though in fact he was now re only recognized as a colonial artist, not as an English artist. You know, it's a version of the convict stain in art, if you like. Um, but he really fell at home uh, in the Chelsea Arts Club, uh, where he is still to this day an icon of the club. When Hillary and I dropped in on the club in 2018, we walked through the front door and there are three caricatures of Fullwood hanging in the club, and the secretary said he is still one of the most honored past members of the club. Imagine that. At any rate, to earn a living, one of the things that Fullwood did while he was in London was to do about 150 watercolors for the postcard king, Raphael Tuck. And these watercolors of scenes of Australia and New Zealand were turned then into postcards, oilettes, as they were called. There was a set of six of Hobart. So on the left is the original watercolor, which is at TMAG, and there's the postcard uh, on the right. Um, another of the postcards was a view of Mount Wellington and Hobart. I reckon this is probably the image that he created of that large oil painting that uh, disappeared quite a while ago. But a pretty nice postcard, you'd reckon, and particularly at the time when postcards weren't necessarily all that compelling aesthetically. And here are four other uh, postcards uh, from, from that set, these, these views of Hobart. In addition to his work as a postcard artist, he also extended his skill as a printmaker. And his etchings, like the one on the left, take on a lot of the more heavily worked feeling of the etcher Frank Brangwen, who was also teaching Jesse Trail uh, at the time. But on the right is where Fullwood made a great breakthrough in, the, in his work with monotypes, which is a hybrid form of etching and oil painting, which was, produces these singular uh, impressions, as they're called, 
really remarkable effects, and unlike, uh, utterly unlike anything Fullwood had produced previously in his career. His style also changed as a watercolorist, an oil, oil painter becoming a much more uh, richly English impressionist uh, in character. This is a watercolor of a, of a chalk pit, looking like a bit of clotted cream. Um, here's the use of the heavy use of palette knife of another hop farm, but this time this one in Kent. And he even got to South Africa on a commission at one point and painted some lovely evocations of, um, of Cape Town uh, as well in that period. He was doing what he could to keep body and soul together in what was a really difficult and competitive market uh, in, uh, in London. In fact, all the Australian expatriates were struggling uh, in, in that way, but they kept going. And then the First World War comes, and all of a sudden that work stops, and 25 members of the Chelsea Arts Club, including Robert Streeton and Fullwood, enlist in the Royal Army Medical Corps as medical orderlies at the Third London General Hospital. And the wounded that they initially treat are the wounded from Gallipoli. And Fullwood is prevailed upon by the women of the Australian Natives Association in London to supply the watercolor for the Gallipoli Christmas card. And this is probably the most viewed bit of war art to come out of the First World War because of the vast number of casualties to whom it was sent, whether they were invaliding uh, in, uh, in England or uh, Egypt or even, even Australia, as well as being sent to their fa families. And he was greatly recognized for this work. But when his own health failed him, because remember he was working 14 hour shifts over a period of two and a half years in his mid 50s, this was rough stuff. When he was invalided out of the Third London General Hospital, he was appointed an official Australian war artist, went to the sum in May of 1918 along with Streeton, produced this lovely oil of the Valley of the Sum, kind of the reverse of that view of Lake Karangamite uh, that I showed you earlier from the picturesque atlas. Um, Here's a watercolor of his billet. No, he didn't stay in the chateau. He stayed in the tent by the, cha by the chateau. <laughs> but again, Hillary and I uh, went to this chateau in 2018 because um, the family that still owned the chateau put on an exhibition of the war art of Fullwood, Fred Least, and uh, Arthur Streeton. And Fullwood took pride of place. And it was just stunning, partly because they had easels set outside in front of the scenes that were painted at that time, but also because when they, they saw that Fullwood's great niece had turned up for the occasion, we were treated like royalty. Well, we had great recognition on the sum and at the Chelsea Arts Club, but not in Australia, as it happened. One of the great aspects of Fullwood's war art was looking at what was happening to the men behind the lines, regaining their humanity, in this case by playing a game of cards while the sun dapples down on the tents and the washing uh, behind them. He also produced some significant war pictures, all but one of which um, have been lost, including this one, which was photographed for the cover of a, a London uh, illustrated newspaper of the v Battle of villers bretonneux Charles Bean loved that particular painting, and indeed Fullwood went back to France with Bean after the First World War to look at the battlefields and take account of the uh, the carnage, if you like, of the war. Really poignant, that sketch on the left was done on Christmas Day, 1919, on the coldest day, said Charles Bean, that he had ever experienced in his life, and there was Fullwood sketching uh, that scene on that day. But on the other hand, the scene on the right is a beckoning scene of Diggers in a more peaceful light, planning to return, as did Fullwood, to Sydney, a very different Sydney from the one that he had left 20 years earlier. And Fullwood, I think this came at a time in his life when he was needing a bit of lightness and joy and sunlight, and it absolutely flooded into his pictures at this point. This is the front at Manly. Again, just notice how beautifully kitted out, fresh from DJs, uh, these promenaders uh, were. This is now a signature work of the Manly Art Gallery. Um, but again, he painted lovely, homely, domestic scenes by the, by the harbor, uh, again, emphasizing the peacefulness and the relief people were feeling, as well as the joy. This is a little watercolor he dashed off at Cronulla. Um, and again, it's, it's almost timeless, or at any rate, it feels very like Cronulla, you know, could be today. 
Um, he only showed, uh, he only had one exhibition in Tasmania in 1927. It was uh, a, uh, an exhibition of etchings, one of which was this old mill, which could well be the surviving image uh, of the big oil that he did of that scene uh, 20 years earlier. And finally, um, yes, definitely finally. <laughs> so finally, um, Full would return to Sydney. He was a, an elder bohemian and much beloved by the young cartoonists of Sydney at that time. Um, he, uh, he, he died happily, I suspect, uh, probably not long after another drinking session at the Sydney Journalist Club uh, in October of 19, 1930. So that's a bit of a gallop. But nonetheless, I hope that gives you some idea of the art and career of Fullwood. Now, I don't know what you make of that, but I'll tell you what my reading is, having been through the trenches uh, with Mr. Fullwood for 10 years. On this reading, I think Fullwood has to be reckoned as a central figure in the art of his times. He was certainly the most versatile artist of his generation, a talented illustrator who profoundly influenced Australia's visual culture, he was an important Impressionist painter and an essential bridge to Roberts and Sydney and Street and the Sydney artists. He was an innovative printmaker, particularly with the monotype, a champion of young artists and his fellow professionals, a progressive influence, along with Louisa Swan, on the development of Tasmanian art and artists in the 1890s, and a distinguished war artist. So when you put all of that together, I'd say it was high time to remember Fullwood and his Tasmanian connections, which of course begs the question, so why has he been forgotten? Maybe that'll come up in a brief Q&A, who knows? Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, as long as you have patience. Is it a bit warm in here or is it just me and my jacket? You okay? All right, good, great. Can I just say, as a university lecturer from long ago, doing the graveyard shift like this is really something. So if people are still awake at the end. I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a plus. <laughs> anyway, any questions? Yeah. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. <laughs> You're most welcome, I'm sure. Um, well, Tom Roberts spent a fair bit of time in Tasmania, I think, didn't he? He did. No, and, but the interesting thing, and believe me, I have read all 800 pages of Humphrey McQueen's biography of Tom Roberts, uh, is that, yes, he came to, to uh, Tasmania quite frequently, never produced a significant picture of Tasmania. A few minor ones, but nothing that he ever showed and nothing that really ever turns up. Um, he did, of course, subsequently marry a Tasmanian and is buried here. But the point I, that I really needs making is that of all the mainland artists at that time, the only one, the only one in the 1890s who actually came here and painted Tasmania, as well as working with the local artists, was Fullwood. So there you go. Thanks. Yeah. Did he bring his family with him when he was moving, you know, from Sydney to Tasmania and the UK and everything? And also, do you have a, a hypothesis about why he has been neglected or forgotten about? Well, there's, there's two bits to the question. The, the, e the easiest bit is that it was only his last visit that he came with his wife, uh, Clyda, uh, at the beginning of 1899. They left their young son, Philip, I guess, with Clyda's parents, I hope, uh, because they went off to New Zealand and then came back to uh, Hobart via, via New Zealand. That was the only time um, that, and that uh, uh, oil painting of the windmill uh, on the back, it's for Clyda, that case there. But unfortunately, um, and I go into this in the book, it's an incredibly sad story. When Clyda goes to London with two young children in 1901, 1902, and then falls pregnant again, it begins her descent into madness. And uh, she never escaped that and was in an asylum for the rest of her life and died in 19, 1918. And how that answers your question is that therefore when Fullwood died, there was no dutiful wife to organize the writing of the biography, to salt the, the galleries with pictures, to go on 
you know, keeping the flame alive uh, for her mate, which uh, in different ways uh, uh, George Lambert and uh, Tom Roberts uh, did. Arthur Streeton tooted his own horn very well, thank you very much. And indeed, the story that we tend now to know about the art of that era is basically Streeton's story. And surprise, surprise, guess who was a featured player uh, in that particular particular story. So we know about Heidelberg, we know about Australian Impressionism in terms of the, the landscapes of Street and uh, the bush scenes of Roberts and McCubbin, but you'll notice that in fact, it's a small number of works produced in a short period of time by less than half a percent of the artists actively working in Australia, none of whom uh, was a female until quite recently and none of whom came from Sydney. And so, and so, to be honest, despite the biography, um, you know, which I've, I've loved doing and it's such a great story and there's such new art that people have never seen, I'm glad to have done all that, but that won't be sufficient to ensure that Fullwood is remembered. For him to be remembered, we'll actually have to change the story. We'll actually have to change the narrative. And Ashley will know that's really tough. <laughs> that's really tough to change that because we've all grown up with the stories, haven't we? All grown, and it's been reinforced by countless exhibitions, including the recent one at the NG, NGV. And 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 so to challenge that story, and I'm trying to do that in in other contexts, uh, you'd have to do a lot of different things. You'd first of all have to say, you've got to bring black and white art into the story. And the minute you do, you all of a sudden realize, my goodness, there's a heap of art, interesting art, um, that comes out of that particular tradition, and particularly out of Sydney. Um, what else would you have to do? I've got it here. Um, you'd have to see that the artists in Sydney and the artists in Victoria were working off very similar views about settler colonial Australia. They were working off very similar influences aesthetically um, because they were, above all, and this is tough to say to an Australian audience, forgive my accent, um, they were all British artists. Yes, they were here in Australia, but everybody's been wanting from the get-go to start talking as quickly as possible about not colonial art, but about Australian art. And the art of the Australian Impressionists has been used to fly the flag and say, at last, we've got Australian art. Well, you'll note that in the reviews of the picturesque atlas, it was the art of the atlas that was first identified as saying, ah, at last we've got some Australian art, even though the, it was Americans who did the whole thing and then used British uh, trained Australian artists to then come in and add, add the pictures. But nonetheless, um, you know, th that, was, that was the reality. And if you start then thinking about, and this is not to do down in any way the beauty and significance of the work that Robert Streeton and the others did, but if you start thinking about them as British artists or British Australian artists, then it makes so much sense why they then went, when things got bad here, why they went to London. Even though art historians here have been lamenting, why didn't they go to Paris? Okay, and you know, you, I, I could see Bernard Smith and lots of others shedding tears. You know, why didn't they go to, to Paris? But they went to London because London was not only the source of their significant artistic influences, some of which were French inflected, but also it was their it was home. It was their cultural identity, and 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 this is something else. Sorry, it's like the Paul Kelly song. Don't get me started talk talking, <laughs> but but. You'll note that when we want to look at the art of these guys, and they were mainly guys, what we want to look at is the art they did here in Australia. We don't, we're not particularly interested in the work that they did in London, their English art. But I can tell you, it's as much their art, it's as much British Australian art, what they did in London, as what they did, did here. And some of it is incredibly accomplished, and in some ways more accomplished, than what they achieved in their earlier period here in Australia. Um, this is particularly true of Fullwood. Fullwood was a lifelong learner, and I believe he increased in stature and skill uh, when he was there, you know, back there uh, in London. 
Now that was more than you probably wanted to know, but <laughs> anyway, I'm, but there you go. <laughs> with a mask. Um, that was sort of superseded by the modernism of photography. So a lot of those artists who were practicing in black and white were easily quite readily been pushed to the to the background. There was, and and that was that was uh, uh, in in part because uh, photography began to catch up as a medium of reproducing scenes. But until the beginning of the 20th century, really photographers were unable either to be present or to have the facility for reproducing these scenes that the artists were able, able to do. Um, the other thing is that the reproduction of images um, that was occurring at that time, the photo process wood engraving was absolutely magnificent, but it was very costly, extremely costly. And finally, when something called the halftone process came along, which allowed for the direct uh, transfer, particularly of photographic images, to these halftone blocks. Um, A, the quality of illustration in the Illustrated Press nosedived, but it became much cheaper to produce uh, illustrated work. And the last frontiers of black and white artists were therefore um, advertising and, cart and cartoons. Um, and, but with that went a lot of craft, particularly draftsmanship skills, et cetera. Um, but those who wanted to continue then had to go into etching monotypes, that kind of thing, which in a way was uh, the next step along and a little bit higher in the hierarchy of art, uh, you know, as well. It's a big story uh, about, you know, people have written reams and reams about the mechanical reproduction of art. But the upside is that it was this mechanical reproduction of art in the second half of the 19th century that all of a sudden opened up the audience for art enormously and opened up the possibilities of artists making a living uh, as they went along. But that era ended um, in the 1890s, essentially. Um, and interestingly, Australia was the beneficiary in that the picturesque atlas of Australasia was the last great uh, uh, example of wood engraved art uh, you know, in, in the world at that time. Yes, and the National Library as well. So it's, it's available there both in the original parts, <laughs> in the original parts, um, but also in the bound volumes. And you can actually still go on eBay and you can you know, pick up you know, bound volumes uh, of, of it as, as well. And I, I wish I could give you an example of it today because uh, the quality of the paper and the printing and the richness of the illustrations, it really has to be seen uh, to, to be believed. But that was it. That was the, the, the last hurrah, if you like, of that, uh, of that kind of art. OK. Well, I think possibly I've extended your patience you know, long enough. You, sorry. I haven't mentioned the painting here, Gary. Oh, I, sorry. I did, did. But yes, yeah, so just to say, the, old, the, the real old man in old clothes is there in the flesh, as it were, uh, for you to have a closer look at, if you wish. Thanks, thanks Hillary. And if you want to ask any further questions of me, you know, I'll be out, I'll be out at, a, at the, the signing table if any uh, of you care to have a closer look at the book and would like to, to buy it. And Hillary also knows a thing or two about Fullwood, as you can imagine. And you must give her some sympathy. This is the third time in three days she has heard this talk. So <laughs> thank you very much. I want to say hi to from, from um, thank you. I'd like to, uh, to thank you very much, Dr. Wersky, for coming and talking to us. I mean, I think I could have, um, you know, words don't, don't kind of, you know, escape me for how important it is for this type of scholarship where the broad strokes of, of um, art history that we have in Australia can actually be filled in by the illustrations and the smaller marks of people that are kind of in the periphery yeah. that need, need scholarship to bring them forward. Mm. Pardon the pun. Um, but um, but yeah, so so thank you so much for sharing that with us because you know that you know that kind of like you know broadens our um, our story and the story of this gentleman here can now be added to what we know about the painting, yeah. which um, which then kind of then somebody in a hundred years time can actually then say well it was only because we had a researcher of this story come that could actually piece together the history, mm. you know kind of like part. You know, you've got in one hand you've got a butterfly net, in the other hand you've got a, a, a microscope. So, <laughs> um, so thank you so much.
Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Dr. Dr. Wersky will be, will be out, of course, um, signing copies of the book if you'd like a copy of the book um, and. Um, and story that's obviously worth worth telling and we're very grateful that you've coloured it in so very well for us. Thank, Thank you, you so, so very much. much. Thank you. Credit to Kay too. Kay has really hung in there herself. So. <laughs>